The train had already started. The old cars, pushing each other, picked up speed. The station platform, stained with rain puddles like camouflage, slowly floated along the train. Against the background of leaden clouds, the silhouette of the Kursk railway station was already projected and swiftly rushed back. Comrade Lieutenant, what are you doing? Are you deaf? Go to the carriage, as I told you. It's cold. An elderly conductor pulled me inside the vestibule. The door, into which the prickly, wet wind was blowing, slammed shut. Somehow the invisible threads that connected me with Moscow, which was receding, were severed at once. It was hot in the commander's car. In a thick pall of smoke from the stove and tobacco dimly shone through the light bulbs, passengers neatly spread out overcoats, housily settling down on the hard shelves. A leisurely muffled conversation was heard. What, Lieutenant? Are you looking for a seat? Sit down. You can sleep on the third shelf, you're still young. The grey-haired commander with a sleeper on his green buttonholes smiled at me and moved over to make room for me. Opposite, in the dense shadow falling from the upper shelf, it was not without difficulty to discern several figures in gymnosurskim. A young female military doctor smiled sadly, clearing away the smoke. Yes, we used to go from Kursk station to the resort, and now to the front. My neighbour turned to me. And this is your first time, Lieutenant, to the front? Nothing. Remember, the devil is not as bad as they make it out to be. Here, I'll show it to my son if I have to, and the old captain threw some Hitler's iron crosses on the folding table. The most difficult thing at the front is to get to your unit. I know from personal experience, but together with the unit, with my own, everything is easier. Soon I was able to fully appreciate the wisdom of these words. I did not know what unit I would be sent to and on what part of the front it was located. But the desire to get to my, still unknown to me, unit as soon as possible increased to the point of pain. On the typed form of the prescription was typed a dozen words on a typewriter rank, surname, first name and patronymic, and then in the appropriate columns was written company commander, Saint. Anna, to the disposal of the general. Anna, at the disposal of General Bordzilovsky. In the personnel department in Moscow, briefly explained that the general is the head of the engineering troops of the Voronezh front and that he would decide my future fate. At that time, it was hard to assume that it would take a week and a half to get to the unit, located only 600 kilometres from Moscow. As soon as I laid down on my overcoat, I immediately fell asleep. Through the dream I heard that there was a check of documents, that the train driver won the duel with the pilot Messerschmitt, that the military doctor from our car was called to the wounded women. I woke up from the explosion of bombs in front of Maturinsk. The train did not go further. German aviation bombed the tracks. We had to leave the warm wagon, which had become so cosy. It was already quite light when we walked along the sleepers to the beautiful station of Maturinsk. Fortunately, remained undamaged. The military commandant's assistant on duty, who was darting between the echelons, informed us that no trains would go to Gryadze until the tracks were restored. And you, comrade lieutenant, will have to make a detour through Tambov, he said. Go to the receiving station. I will notify. At night, long before the late winter dawn, a working train was leaving for Tambov. That suited me. The small local carriage was filled to capacity with young people. The windows taped with strips of paper and tightly curtained isolated us from the outside world. A single bulb, like the moon from behind the clouds, illuminated the carriage a little. The girls sang and the guys picked up a song popular at the time. The beloved city can sleep peacefully and dream dream dreams and turn green in the spring. Their singing as if nothing had happened, as if there were no war, grinned the woman sitting on the sack. The district route to the front headquarters passed through Tambov, Balashov, Poverino. At each of these stations transfers and languid waiting for trains. Military echelons were delayed for a short time while the locomotive was changed. Red Army soldiers with kettles, as if with grenades, attacked the station boilers. 
The anti-aircraft machine guns on the platforms occasionally poured out a stream of tracer bullets and froze in mute expectation. At these moments everyone, as if spellbound, fell silent for a moment and looked in the direction of the fiery coloured dots. The dead end station with an unusual name Anna, not far from which the field headquarters of the Voronezh Front was located, met me on a marvellous winter day. The sun's glare illuminated the first snow that had fallen during the night. The station platform and the lonely station house seemed like islands in a snow-white sea. It was obvious from everything that the early winter of 1942-43 had immediately taken hold. Lonely sledges and people in overcoats were moving towards the blue-black forest in sharp contrast to the snow, sometimes falling half a wheel into the loose snow. A small gazik overtook us. Only when we came close to the edge of the forest, we could see the camouflaged barriers. Here, in the woods, it was not easy for a newcomer to find the dugouts of the engineering department of the front. General Y.V. Bordzilovsky was with the troops. In the log shelter I was received by a stocky Colonel V.K. Belyakov. Do you know mines? What kind? Finally, the academy is engaged in mines as it is required by our serious adversary. It's time. Let's send Colonel Krasnov to the Special Forces Brigade. He's short-staffed. They had a car from them yesterday, but it's a pity we didn't get there in time. Now I'll have to get there myself. Having received a new order, I got to Butulanovka, where the headquarters of the 42nd Separate Engineering Brigade of Special Purpose. In a two-storey wooden house, lost among the hills on the outskirts of the district centre, it was quiet and little reminded of the war. The deputy commander of the brigade, Lieutenant Colonel N.V. Petrov, turned out to be a sociable man. He was interested in the Military Engineering Academy, evacuated in 1941 from Moscow to Frums, asked about the teachers. And now to business, suddenly changed the subject Lieutenant Colonel. We'll send you to the 210th, to Maisyakov, a combat commander. Sapachapai, sometimes and can do something naughty. He needs competent commanders, and you'll need his experience. There's a Pompokos from the 200th. Go with him. That day my lonely vagrancy ended. Together with the battalion's toboggan wagon, we moved towards the Don. Well, young man, you're dressed out of season. I'm so cold. General Moroz doesn't like to joke. Having uttered these words, V.V. Kazelov, the assistant to the battalion commander on the economic part, ordered the captain to pick me a half-coat, felt boots, and a Nushanka hat. Slowly the sledge moved between white hillocks on the snow-covered road. Frozen snow crust squeaked under the skids. The riders shouted at the horses, which were covered with sweat, and flicked the reins. We walked on foot, pushing the heavy sledges uphill and sitting on them downhill. Just like in 812, the same sleds help. Are you smiling? But cars can't get through here now. Only goose steppers. With his help in three days we'll provide the battalion with everything, said, squinting his grey tired eyes, Senior Lieutenant Kizelov. At first there was frozen silence all around. But the closer we moved to the Don, the louder became the bursts of gun duels and the rumble of artillery cannonade. The barrels of anti-aircraft guns sticking out of the snow-covered trenches became more frequent. To the left and right of the road, under the white masks, one could distinguish rear units and reserve units. And in turquoise into cloud gaps, more and more often began to glimpse pairs of our yak and German messes. Behind in the snow remained villages with native Russian names Klepovo, Jurovka Ruskaya, Upper Nilusha. And finally, on the third day, we approached Verknyaya Maman. Here we could already feel the proximity of the front. On the road, the Red Army soldiers were pushing with difficulty the slipping trucks pulling guns with white spots of camouflage on the trailer. Behind the hillocks, in the gullies, in the fields, between the woods, the attentive eye could notice the branched snow tracks, the transparent blue shadows of artillery firing positions, the solitary figures of soldiers, the small black spots of the entrances to the dugouts. Everything said that here, in the snow, there is its own, carefully hidden from the enemy's eye, tense troop life. The short winter day was burning up. The bright crimson circle of the sun, 
which foreshadowed a strong wind for tomorrow, had already disappeared behind the hills. Our toboggan wagon set up in a wooded ravine, two or three kilometres from the Don. From here an elderly Red Army soldier from the service department led me along a narrow snowy path through a forest of young trees to the battalion headquarters. The steam from the frosty air that had blown into the dugout gradually dissipated. A smokestack made of a copper artillery shell shone weakly. From the trench stove smoked a light smoke. It was possible to see the legs of the resting commanders sticking out from the bunk beds. It smelled of fresh bread and tobacco. It was cosy and good after the frost that burned the skin. The commander, sitting in the back of the dugout, at a board table near the map, interrupted my attempt to report. Quiet. Combat is resting. Soon a broad-shouldered man in a wrinkled undershirt and cotton pants slid down from the bunk. His attentive eyes, deeply seated on a large cheekbone face, scrutinised me from head to toe. Having listened to the report, the commander grumbled. From the academy. So, an academician. But to command the company I will not allow you. That's it. I have already made a submission for the nomination of one of our commanders. Even though we didn't graduate from the academy, we're no worse at fighting than others. What is this? Seriously. Or is he working under Chapai, I tensely thought. Battalion commander noticed my confusion and already soft added. Okay, we'll figure it out. Stop spending the night, he then shouted cheerfully. Get up, who is still alive. All the inhabitants of the dugout got up. They brought dinner in cauldrons, took out a cherished flask. Combat Senior Lieutenant F.E. Maziakov himself poured front hundred grams. I hope you are drinking, academician. Not like a senior lieutenant of medical service, he looked in the direction of the battalion Dr. Anya Kolmakova. The norm of the people's commissar. Well, overnight a friend of the miners. The duty officer reported that the companies had moved out. Buster. It's time for us too. You, comrade senior lieutenant, Maziakov turned sharply to the young commander, will go to the mines with the second company. Understood. That's right. Deputy Commander for Political Affairs V. I. Zaitsev calmly and firmly replied. I think today I'd better go with the first company. The deputy commander is sick and there are few communists. I'll go with the first company myself. And you, please go with the second. All right, Fyodor Vasilyevich, I'll go with the second. It's not the time to argue. It's no time to agitate me either. I've already been agitated. I've been fighting since day one. From Brest Prusiny. That's right. All right then. Let's go. December 1942, bogging down in the snow. The winter was unusually cold for those places. West of Stalingrad, the Don, Stalingrad and southwestern fronts had already closed the ring around Paulus's 6th Army, and to the north from Voronezh to Vashenskaya the front line ran along the Don. At Verkhny Mamon our front line was on the left low bank of the Don. The right bank, occupied by the enemy, towered above us. The wind drove the snow along the frozen river and hummed there, as in a chimney. And the Don? We couldn't see it. Covered with ice, covered with a layer of snow compacted by the wind, it seemed like a clearing connecting both banks. Everyone knew that the Italians were defending in front of us, someone specified, calling the infantry division Cossaria, according to the testimony of a prisoner. The soldiers abbreviated the name of the enemy Italians. Alpine gunners from the 8th Italian Army relatively little bothered us. They did not prevent us from walking at full height between the left bank bushes, talking in full voice, and even occasionally driving up on a steam sled with mines to the bank cliff. Life was precisely regulated. In the mornings the Italians led a half hour of sluggish shelling. It was called Dopike. Then there would be a pause. By noon they would send a lunchtime load of metal in our direction, and by supper evening. Sometimes Italian narrow winged planes appeared, dropping small bouncing bombs of the fragmentation grenade type, aptly nicknamed winglets. Our artillery and mortars also timed their firing raids to coincide with the Italians' food distribution periods. 
At that time, the enemy left their dugouts and were most vulnerable. Such artillery raids were called wishing them a pleasant appetite. On long winter nights, the Italians were restlessly firing flares. Especially brightly illuminated the area of Derizovka, a small village on a high cliff a ledge of the right bank. Here was a stronghold of the enemy. The Italians were almost continuously firing machine gun, and machine gun bursts into the darkness of the night, as if warning us that they were awake. Our rifle units, occupying the trenches on the eastern bank of the Don, also increased their vigilance at night, looking carefully into the darkness descending on the Don ice. From time to time rockets were launched from our side and short bursts of machine gun fire were fired. Though Italians are a quiet enemy, but keep your ear to the ground. That's right. It is known that in a quiet pool of devils are found, instructed us combat. And in the evenings, when the commanders gathered in the headquarters dug out, and after the tasking there was time to go to the minefields, everyone asked Lieutenant Technician A.S. Cherkashin to sing. He deftly picked the strings of the guitar and in a gypsy manner began. Here by the Pacific Don, by the gardens of Mammon, the snow is silver. By the steep banks, only a monotonous fire, and the barely audible moans, they give out the lurking. Close enemies. Dot, 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 the 210th Independent Battalion of Engineer Barriers, or Biz for short, was young. It was formed only two months ago. Of the 360 men required by the state, there were still less than half. There were only 40 to 45 men in the engineer mine companies, and instead of three platoons there were only two each. There were very few young fighters. Most of the miners have long passed over 40. All people were craftsmen, carpenters, mechanics, fitters, people experienced and reliable. It was easy with them. Often they themselves gave good advice. They understood commanders from half a word, but age made itself felt. At my age, my son, it's hard to crawl without a mine, one of them complained to me once. In the military enlistment office, they said for the construction of bridges, but here's where things have turned. A month ago, most of our fighters did not know how to approach a mine, and unit commanders lacked practical experience, but war makes you do anything. During the day we studied and rested. At night we mined the Donbank. A few men blew themselves up. The rest gradually learned all the subtleties and peculiarities of their new, dangerous craft. All of them knew their own mines and methods of their installation firmly, but with the study of mines of the enemy was more difficult. At that time we had mastered only German anti-tank TME and anti-personnel semi-35. The battalion had their samples. Other mines, including Italian mines, were known to us only from the meagre information of the front headquarters, and we did not even know about some types of mines. And no wonder in all armies mines are classified as secret, even top secret weapons. They should be a surprise to the enemy not only by the place of installation, but also by design. A miner faced with a mine unknown to him cannot clear it without risking his life. During the training, platoon and company commanders paid special attention to safety measures. Old men, as our commander called them, who had already accumulated experience for many sleepless nights, willingly complimented their commanders. Mine requires care like a small child. Here patience and love above all. And it happens that the mine is worse than the most capricious old woman you do not know from which side to approach. The old men were carefully preparing for each exit. I noticed it at once, as soon as they put me in the platoon dugout of the second company. Why are you up early? Appealed to them Deputy Company Commander V. N. Nazarov, holding back a kind smile on his thin face. We would rest for another three hours. Start early, the heart is glad. Joked full and cheerful Red Army P. N. Bovin the soul of the platoon. And how are things in Stalingrad? Have you heard anything new, Comrade Deputy Commander? Things are hot. We're surrounded in a way Hitler never dreamed of. He's trying to break through from the outer front, but no way. The times are not what they used to be. Even canners will fade now. And what kind of a beast is this? Bovin asked. Canners? A village in Italy. Hannibal defeated the Roman army near it. 
It was a long time ago, Pavel Nikolaevich, so you've forgotten. More than two thousand years have passed, no joke, smiled Nazarov. And Stalingrad is hotter than ours, you say? Bovin inquired. You're a fool, Pasha, as I see it, Yuvarov intervened in the conversation. You read the bulletins, but you say such things. Compared to Stalingrad, we're just a sanatorium now. Yuvarov is right, confirmed the lieutenant. But we, comrades, have enough to do. Soon we'll have to go out to mines. I see you're already preparing. Exactly, we are preparing, comrade deputy commander. We still need to check the receipts. You understand we're not going to go for potatoes, the elderly miner SD. Yuvarov explained in no hurry. It's preparation. You yourself, comrade lieutenant, warned that a miner can't make mistakes, added Bovin, shaking his greying head. The talk died down. Everyone returned to the interrupted business. Some were checking the springs and fuse checks, some were cutting detonator cases with pink knives, some were removing grease from fuse cases. The time to go out for mining was approaching. One of the soldiers quietly pulled a familiar song. We weren't born miners. But without mines in the war. Dot 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 the mines were set off at nightfall. It was a little more than a kilometre to the front line about thirty minutes walk. I went on the mission with Shachabak's platoon. The mines were carried first on light skids. Then the skids left in the bushes and went down into the passage of the message. Each of the miners took two mines with him. The rest were brought by specially allocated for this purpose old men, who were already difficult to crawl. In the course of the message and in the trench is tight cannot disperse. Hey infantry make way, you see I'm carrying mines. Or we'll take off together, the miners parroted the clumsy infantrymen. The detonators and mine detonators, without which the explosives of mines did not work, were with the commanders of departments and platoons. Detonators tried to keep away from mines. December 8th, we mined a section of gentle descent to the Don, accessible to tanks. The narrow sickle of the moon was completely hidden by the middle of the night. Only the sharp eyes of the miners accustomed to darkness allowed them to orient themselves on the terrain. The fierce December frost was trying to get behind the collar and into the sleeves of the coat together with the wind. Do not dare to equip mines in mittens, even though it is cold, Sergeant A.M. Shachabak warned his men. Our work is jewellery. Grease your fingers with goose fat in Mamona. I got it from the mistress. Andrei Markovich Sherbak was then replacing the platoon commander. His large, athletic figure stood out among the others. His broad face was serious and friendly at the same time. He spoke calmly and weightily. Well, the fat is not for everyone, of course, but only for the outfitters. To dig a hole and place a mine in the snow, it is more convenient in mittens. The directions of installation are clear to everyone. Now about the depth. The sergeant looked in my direction, slightly restraining a smile, let's test the newcomer, and asked. Why, comrade lieutenant, at what depth to put mines today? The question is simple, and how to answer it more precisely. I painfully began to remember the lessons on mine work at the academy. That's when I felt the lack of practical experience. It all depends on the density and depth of the snow cover. What do you think? In such snow, 30 centimetres with tamping, perhaps, answered, smiling, Shebak. I only had to agree with the experienced sergeant. Spreading out among the squads, the miners got out of the trench and crawled, dragging the mines behind them. The border of the minefield was about 20 metres from our first trench. They installed anti-tank mines Yam-5, a box mine. The miners jokingly called them pits, and the installation and especially the removal of these mines the game in the box. Don't play in the box, but don't play in the box was a common saying among them. In the conditions of evacuation of industry from the western regions, these mines became indispensable because of the simplicity of their manufacture. In the harsh 40-second oblong wooden boxes for mines were made in woodworking factories and in semi-artisanal workshops. The box was the body of the mine. Two briquettes of ammonite and a tolka checker were put into it, and a simplified fuse with a mine detonator was inserted into the side opening. 
The play on words to play in the box had a special meaning when mind box minds. But this phrase did not reflect the actual state of affairs. In case of explosion of five kilograms of explosives from a person or a group of people, nothing was left. Naturally, the most experienced and reliable sergeants and Red Army soldiers were allocated to equip the mines. At that time, platoon commanders themselves often performed this operation. Special attention was paid to safety checks and mine detonators MD. These M Dashki the heart of the mine. They give life to the explosion explained to newcomers, experienced miners. Do not joke with the detonator. Sometimes that and the click is triggered. You put it in a pencil case, then both he and you will be calmer. Three hours had passed since the beginning of the mine sweeping. Miners in pairs began to return to the trench. Everyone was rubbing their fingers, stiffened by the frost, dancing, squatting on squats, smoking cigarettes. The Italians opened a quick artillery and mortar fire. The devils are awake. Did they see it? But bursts were heard to the right and left of the minefield, and in depth behind our trench. Fyodor Puzanov didn't come back. God knows where he disappeared to. After all, he was already crawling to the trench, the soldiers reported. We have to look for him. It wasn't the Italians who took him. Maybe during an artillery attack. It'll be light soon. Sergeant Sherbak looked anxiously at the sky who will go in search. I, Yerats, a thin, 35-year-old Red Army man with a pleasant face that always expressed a slight surprise, volunteered to go. Both miners and infantrymen watched him carefully from the trench. Oh, I wouldn't run into a mine myself. An agonizing half an hour passed. Here he was, dragging Fyodor. Several pairs of hands took the Red Army man F.A. Puzanov into the trench. It turned out that during the shelling he was concussed, lost consciousness, and fell into a ravine on the edge of the minefield, not far from the trench. I would probably have frozen among the mines if it hadn't been for Viktor Puzanov said. Among the men of the company Viktor Ivanovich Yerats kept inconspicuous and modest, but in moments of danger as if transformed and was always ahead. He mined and demined a lot on the Don, in Markovka in Kharkov. In March 1943 during street fights for Kharkov he was wounded and here he was pulled out of the fire of the approaching German tank by Fyodor Puzanov. After two months of wandering around hospitals, Yerat sent me a message. I still have a yellowed, written-in-pencil postcard dated May 18th, 1943. Letter from Viktor Ivanovich Yeratz, a fighter known to you. Good afternoon or evening, much respected comrade lieutenant. I send my kind greetings to you and to my comrades, and to Shabak AMMM and I send my low bow to Puzanov Fedor for saving me from death when I was wounded. I am now in a reserve hospital. I'll be back soon. And for now, goodbye to you. I'm still alive. I wish the same for you. We waited for Yerats to return to the company, but he never did. Apparently he was sent to another unit. The commander kept his word. He did not allow me to command the company, but he kept postponing my secondment to the brigade. When a request was made to speed up the decision on my use, he stabbed me with his eyes for a long time, and then joked away. Don't hurry, academician, before the father in the heat. We'll decide everything in due time. Soon after that, D.S. Zhigalov, a tightly bunched, very pleasant lieutenant, who was acting as the battalion adjutant, came into the company dugout. Friendly patting me on the shoulder, he said. Don't take offence at the commander. He wants to keep you in a mine quarantine. That's for sure. I excitedly asked why Mysyakov disregarded the order of the deputy commander. Dmitri Stepanovich thought about it and, smiling, replied, to God high, to the bosses far, and to the enemy hand in hand. Be patient. I think you are just being tested as a newcomer. As for the relationship between our commander and his superiors, it's not an easy matter. He's a man of desperate courage. And it seems to me he's afraid of nothing and nobody in the world. A few days before the Don Offensive, I was summoned to the headquarters. Well, comrade academician, the commander's eyes were running demoniacs, 
Would you like to take a walk to the Italians? I have a chance to distinguish myself. That's it. The commander's reconnaissance of the engineering equipment of the enemy's front line was being prepared. With the onset of darkness, seven men in white camouflage jackets came to our first trench at the edge of the shore. We won't let them on the ice. No command, the commander of the rifle platoon, raised his automatic rifle. But the command caught up with us. We quickly overcame 120 to 140 metres of the dawn ice by rapid runs. We could hardly catch our breath. The wind was howling hard. We listened to it. Our heart was beating every second we were on the shore occupied by the enemy. Well, academician, is it scary? asked the commander. A little scary, I admitted. And from this short but frank dialogue everyone seemed to feel some relief. The site chosen for reconnaissance of mine blast barriers was between two enemy strongholds, Derezovka and Unnamed Farm. It was not occupied by Alpine gunners and was poorly penetrated by flank fire. We entered a depression that resembled an amphitheatre, the slopes of which were covered with trees. The moon peeking out from behind the clouds allowed us to get a good look at the terrain. With feelers and a mine detector we stepped in strict order, footsteps to footsteps to footsteps. Now death was beneath our feet. The flashlight beams slipped on the wire. But Jigalov accidentally stepped on it. My, was all he could shout. Stunned, we waited for the explosion. But it didn't come. Sergeant Shabak, holding his breath, listened to the sounds in the headphones of the mine detector. Then increasing, then fading signals along the axis of the detected wire showed that the frame of the mine detector then approaching the mine then moving away from it. Finally, the sergeant bent down and marked the location of the mine on the snow crust. What is this mine? What is the secret of its design? What are the peculiarities of demining? Nothing was known, and it was necessary to remove it without blowing it up and deliver it as a sample to the battalion. Gigalov gestured to Shabak to move away. Then, having thrown off his gloves, he carefully cut out the hardened white crust with a sapper knife and began to rake the snow with his fingers. Having cut the wire with wire cutters and cleaned the mine, he began to scrutinize the cylindrical metal casing. The lieutenant's fingers shuddered a little from the cold or from internal tension. Dima, let Sherbak disarm it, the commander said half-voiced. But Jigalov only shook his head, held his palm over his face, and again bent over his dangerous find. Soon he handed us an Italian anti-personnel mine. It was about 16 centimetres high and about 10 in diameter. The casing at the top showed small windows. The upper fuse had already been unscrewed by Zhigalov, but there was a protrusion on the side that resembled a second fuse, which also had to be removed. With the help of feelers and a mine detector, we found a dozen more mines hidden under the snow plastic and metal pressure and tension action. We began to remove these samples. Enough. Combat wiped profusely appeared on his forehead sweat. It's time to return. So. Thanks to this reconnaissance was able to find out that the Italians have not moved mines in winter. Some of them froze into the ground. The rest under a layer of snow were seized by a crust of ice. And although the possibility of explosion of individual instances was not excluded, in general, the minefield was not a serious danger. And in this, too, the Italians did not adapt to the Russian winter. And on our shore, the accumulation of troops began. Artillery and infantry kept arriving and arriving. They camouflaged themselves in the bushes. Cars were hidden in ravines. They unfolded insulated tents. It got crowded. Everyone was talking about Stalingrad. They shared the latest news about the heavy fighting. Kotelnikovsky, Aksai Isarlovskaya River, Verkhny Komsky settlement, these names were repeatedly mentioned in the conversation. The situation on the bridgeheads in the city itself was discussed with special excitement. Stalingrad events attracted everyone's attention. And now it was our turn. The 210th Biz began to remove some of the mines, which were placed by our own hands, to arrange passages in the remaining minefields and fence them with wire, so that our own men would not be blown up. At the same time, we were preparing shields for the crossing of troops on the ice of the Don. 
Of course, we could not yet know the plan of the upcoming operation, but we guessed that it was connected with the battle for Stalingrad. And indeed, our 6th Army, commanded by Major General FML Karitonov, turned out to be the right flanking army, which contributed to the reflection of Hitler's attempts to break through to the encircled, also 6th, Army of F. Paulus. On the night of December 16, 1942, in the battalion, no one slept. The last preparations for the offensive were finishing. At eight o'clock in the morning, the artillery began to speak, and from its mighty voice for an hour and a half, the frosty air shuddered. In the band of the 267th Infantry Division, in the operational subordination of which was our battalion, the forcing of the Don was planned north of Derizovka. The ice there had already reached 35 to 40 centimetres. But near the banks was much thinner. Numerous holes very weakened the carrying capacity of the ice cover. Two companies of our battalion with the beginning of the artillery preparation immediately began to set up a track crossing for light tanks. At first the Italians, dumbfounded by the howling of continuously flying artillery shells, gave no signs of life and our work on the laying of shields moved quickly. Combat ran along the strip of shields and hastened the soldiers. Come on, brothers, hurry up. Connect the shields carefully. Do not disgrace yourselves at the crossing. That's how it is. But as soon as the light tanks moved along the shields laid on the ice, and the infantry in scattered chains went to the right and left directly on the ice, the enemy, who had been silent until then, opened fire on our bank funnels smoked, leaving around soot, as if from extinguished fires. Infantrymen began to fall on the ice, and then the miners who were passing tanks on their shields. One of the Italian shells hit right on the shield track. Two shields shattered into splinters, the neighbouring ones were thrown aside. On the axis of the crossing formed an ice hole. The tanks stopped. Golikov shouted with all his might, the commander, Give me spare largey and shields. Why are you lying low? You can't hide under the ice. The front line is the edge of life. Here we must fight for life. Junior Lieutenant V.I. Golikov, together with several soldiers, dragged the improvised harness to the destroyed part of the crossing. Nearby, an enemy mine slapped and exploded. One of the old men only shrieked and fell into the hole. Hold his legs, shouted the junior lieutenant, and plunged headfirst into the icy water. He hardly managed to grab the wounded man by his coat and pull him to the surface. Another five minutes passed. The enemy's fire weakened but did not cease, and the breach was hidden under a long, solid roll of logs. Tanks with impatiently snorting engines again went to the right bank of the Don, and Golikov, hastily wiping his broad face and wet hair, already covered with silvery ice, was stubborn. Come on. I won't leave until I miss the tanks. At that time, our second company was already making passages in the mine barriers on the enemy's bank, near the place where I went on reconnaissance. This work was headed by Deputy Polite V.A.N. Nazarov, the company commander, was in the hospital. Punch through the extended bravely. We'll check the passage after. Don't be afraid. We won't fly higher than the sky, he shouted to the young skinny junior lieutenant V.I. Bykov. Following the detonation of elongated charges Tolka checkers attached to a narrow board ski, miners with mine detectors and probes were moving, neutralising the few surviving mines in the passages. On the fenced passages safely crossed the minefields of the Italians about a dozen of our tanks. But suddenly at the very enemy bank, one of the tanks went off the shields and fell through the broken ice with its tracks. Movement on the crossing was again stalled. But to our right, one and a half kilometres away, a rutted crossing equipped by divisional sappers ensured non-stop movement of tanks and artillery. And on the left, about two kilometres away, operated the 207th Independent Battalion of Engineer Barriers. In the morning of December 16th, 1942, under the cover of artillery preparation, he began to lay shields on the ice. Some of the firing points located in the cliffs of the opposite bank were not suppressed. The enemy opened heavy machine gun and mortar fire. The battalion immediately suffered casualties in personnel. A few hours later, the 207th Biz was transferred to the construction of a pile bridge near the village of Durazovka. Here it worked in conjunction with the 15th Independent Bridge and Pontoon Battalion. 
Despite heavy enemy fire, the bridge, 160 metres long and with a load capacity of 40 tonnes, was finished by the scheduled date by dawn on December 17th. 73 men were lost by our neighbours from enemy fire during the construction of the crossing and the bridge. This was almost half of the combat personnel of their battalion. Somewhat less was lost that day in our 210th biz. Vivi Kaiselev had to take out on the ice even riders from the utility unit. They helped paramedics to pick up the wounded. Running past me, the Pompokos stopped for a moment, took a breath and shouted. Here's a quiet don for you, father, and a quiet don. It looks like hell, only instead of boiling tar ice water. And people are doing their job, they don't care. Under the blows of our troops, the Italian defence collapsed in a day. Only separate units isolated from each other continued to resist. The 210th Biz, overwhelmed by the avalanche of the offensive, hurried along the rutted toboggan road up the mountain to Tisap Kovo. German messers were continuously attacking the columns from the air, trying to make up for the lack of combat tenacity of their Italian allies on the ground. People fell, cars overturned, but the columns moved forward unstoppably. Before evening the battalion entered Tisapkovo, a small village with houses scattered between deep ravines. It was to be demined. Tisapkovo met us with a heavy sight. On the wastelands and streets of the village, at the steep ravines, at the dugouts, even on the steps of the houses lay corpses in grey Italian overcoats and tunics. Bizarre poses, faces distorted by fear death had befallen the Italian soldiers when they, fleeing from our fire, fell under the fire of German barrier units. Next to the dead were lying light Italian carbines with hinged bayonets, which seemed toy-like. Here also wandered mules, the main draught of the Italian units. The frightened animals, shaking their long ears, squinted at us, as if asking what is this doing. There was actually nothing to demine in Tisapkovo. Our advancing units bypassed this village, which became a graveyard for hundreds of enemy soldiers. In the second half of December, frosts suddenly changed to blizzards. The air warmed a little, but the roads were badly snowed. The columns stopped. Even tanks sat on their bellies deep ravines, treacherously camouflaged by snow, became traps for them. In the area of Tala, all troops and population were put on clearing roads for the passage of tanks and vehicles. Deep passages appeared in the snow-covered fields. On one of these trenches we arrived in Kantimirovka. This militarily important point had already been liberated by the 17th Tank Corps of Major General of Tank Troops P. Poluboyarov. The railroad station Kantimirovka was piled with boxes of ammunition and some bales. Nearby warehouses were bursting with stocks of canned fish and meat, galettes and cigarettes in colourful packaging, from pasta and rum in barrels. Dozens of Fiat trucks froze in the streets of Kantimirovka, with their blunt muzzles in the snow drifts, and between the motionless Fiat's hungry mules, dragging empty sleds, were hanging around. Kantimirovka was a supply station for the 8th Italian Army. Here concentrated everything that was intended for the soldiers, officers and generals of the divisions Chile, Cossieria, Sforziska, Pasubio and Torino. The tankers did not have time to put up guards, Representatives of the front intendant had not yet arrived in Kantimirovka, so there was no order in the warehouses. But as soon as the initiative was taken by Valerian Vesilievich Kiselev, the Pompokos of the 210th Biz, everything fell into place. On the outskirts of Kantimirovka, we finally warmed up in a one-storey brick house. It was there, in this house, that the liaison officer delivered a package with the news about awarding Masyakov and Nazarov with the Order Red Star, and other fighters and commanders with medals. Combat liked it. It's time for you, academician, to take the company. Leave immediately. That's it. Prepare, Dima. The order for the battalion, he ordered his favourite Zhigolov. But the immediate departure to the company was unexpectedly delayed. The sentry opened the door and shouted with all his might. Air. Senior Lieutenant V. I. Zaitsev jumped out on the porch and immediately returned. Airborne Brothers. 
Indeed, on a wide clearing just opposite the house we occupied, a large transport plane was landing with a heavy rumble. Black crosses on the fuselage left no doubt about its belonging. Could it be a paratrooper? In such an airplane could be at least 30 paratroopers, the fight with which did not bode well for us except for a squad of fighters from the control platoon, there was no one with us. Having run a little on the ground, the airplane stopped at the frozen lake. To fight, commanded the commander. We lay down in the bushes, closely following the plane. Afraid, shouted Mazyakov. Crawl closer. We'll take it with our hands. We got the birds. A machine gun burst from the airplane made us stop. We began to dig in the snow with our hands. Oh, I wish I'd captured the airplane. That's a trophy. Dreamed aloud Dima Zhigalov. Maybe we should send for the tankers? They're not far away, suggested the more practical Zaitsev. No way, grumbled the commander. We'll manage on our own. That's how it is. The door of the plane opened. There was a gangway. On it quickly descended a German in a flight jacket and rushed to the engines. Handy Hoksh, surrender, shouted Mysyakov. We opened fire. The German pilot nervously looked around and hurried back to the gangway. The left engine started. Will they really take off? But the heavy plane only slightly turned in our direction. Two Hitlerites went down the ramp. Something was handed to them from behind. They immediately lay down in the snow and fired several long machine gun bursts at us. The crew left the plane. Six Hitlerites ran through the bushes to the lake, shooting away as they went. We rushed after them. At that time there was an explosion. Hundreds of small fragments split the air. The Nazis fell into the snow. The first explosion was followed by a second. Apparently in the plane burst boxes of ammunition intended for the encircled in Stalingrad army of Paulus. There appeared a 30 Chequers tankers came to our aid. They got the only surviving crew member of the German transport plane as a prisoner. Already in the dark I arrived in Bayri, a tiny village about 20 kilometres southwest of Kunti Mirovka. Here I was to receive the second engineer mine company. Not without excitement I stepped over the threshold of a half-snow-covered house. Company Petty Officer P. K. Kara, an elderly man with a wrinkled face, having learned about the purpose of my appearance, kindly said. Oh, TC, good, because our Zovsim is not that. Senior Technician Lieutenant V. Malinin, seeing me, at first embarrassed, and then wheezed. Thank God. Only I don't envy you. It was a man of about forty years old. He had just returned from the hospital, and looked really not that. And he was in a bad mood. Immediately talked about the shortage the company has only forty-nine people, instead of one hundred eight, according to the staff. He began to complain about his fate. An hour later I went to the first platoon. A.S. Rublenko, a stocky, childish-looking rider, and orderly, was worried. I'd better not get to the Nemitsis. On the outskirts of Kaskovka was the leading edge of our defence. Here was a stronghold of the 2nd Battalion of the 846th Rifle Regiment. In the battalion, commanded then by Senior Lieutenant N. I. Igumanov, there were almost as many fighters as in our company. And the platoon of Junior Lieutenant Baikov had to cover the defence of the riflemen with mines. We approached a crooked house. A grey-haired, thin Red Army soldier came out to meet us. Private Vysotsky, supporting his bandaged hand, he reported and immediately asked, Aren't you I don't know your rank the new commander? I, uh, and how did you know about Malinin's replacement? Soldier's ingenuity. We've been waiting for a long time, and you're on the company horse. Where's the platoon now? On a mine clearance. Not far away, about 300 metres from here. I'll lead the way. Are you wounded? Why aren't you in the infirmary? If we go to the sanitary unit with every trifle, there'll be no one to work. We could see a few vague silhouettes through the snow. We went towards them. Comrade Lieutenant. Mikhail Andreevich. This is our new company officer. Vysotsky introduced me. 
Lieutenant Jarov, my deputy introduced himself. He was ten years older than me and already had a solid combat experience. I felt some awkwardness, but the lieutenant immediately made it clear that he was glad of my appointment. The platoon was installing Yam-5 anti-tank mines. Oh, it's a hassle to equip them, complained Zharov. I tell the miners don't forget about the pin. Remember life is like a tear on an eyelash. For precautionary reasons, when equipping mines remained one of the most experienced miner, usually the commander of the department. Others were on the sidelines. The company had already used a safety check, proposed by someone from the old men. It greatly increased the safety of the work. Darkness and snow limited visibility to one and a half or two metres. In order not to get lost, not to fall in with the enemy, a rope was attached to the miner's belt. Feeling it, people felt braver. In the neutral zone this rope was a means of communication with their own. And I was not surprised when I saw Junior Lieutenant V.I. Bykov pulling the ropes restlessly. I wish they hadn't broken. It's pitch black, he repeated several times without addressing anyone. At dawn the platoon gathered in the house assigned to it. M.V. Vysotsky had already boiled tea. As is customary when receiving a unit, I asked if there were any complaints, grievances. The old men only smiled in response. What complaints now? You can't make Hitler sorry by complaining. It was 1943. In the field, the chilling wind whistled a monotonous tune. With a piece of ice cream bread, the skin on my lips was torn off. Frost and wind burned faces and battle reports burned hearts. There were bloody battles near Stalingrad. The enemy was trying to break through to the encircled grouping of Paulus. The Don Front came to the rear of Hitler's 6th Army, and our 6th Army, being in 300 kilometres from Stalingrad, was again preparing to attack. This time the 210th Battalion of Engineering Barriers was on the left flank of the offensive in the area of Ostrogoshsk, Rossosh. The 2nd Engineer Mine Company received an urgent order to arrive in the area of Markovka. In the deep snow the company moved slowly, and time quickly. In a light sled, I went forward for receiving the task at the NP of the 846th Rifle Regiment. Not far from the observation post of the regiment below, in the milky grey Mariva of winter dawn floated the roofs of the village, turned by the enemy into a stronghold. In this cold winter the battles for settlements took on a special significance, and the Germans, who replaced the Italians on our section of the front, fiercely defended the occupied places. They were afraid to violate the Führer's order, but they were even more afraid of General Moros. Having found the regimental engineer, I reported that the company was on the march, and some of the soldiers with the deputy remained to surrender the minefields. What are you talking about? In thirty minutes the attack. The division commander arrived at the regiment's NP. Again, he says, engineering is late. The infantry went up to the attack with a shout of hurrah. The enemy, silent until then, immediately opened heavy fire from mortars and machine guns. The attack was choked. Some commander in a coat came up. The case, Kana. What he meant the failed attack or the promise of my superiors to put me on trial for the company's tardiness, it is unknown. But then Company Commissar Volodya Nazarov arrived and said that he had brought one platoon on a sledge. I went to the regimental NP with a report. The commander of the 267th Rifle Division, Colonel V. A. Gerasimov, was already there. Come up, Lieutenant, he said strictly. You need to provide passageways for the 1st Battalion. Two sleds, on which eight or nine miners were hardly accommodated, rushed down. The horses, sensing the danger, carried quickly. We could hardly hold on to the sledge. Further, everything was like in a dream wind, bullets, snow, mines. Passages in mine barriers were not easy for us. Having barely moved off the mountain, where the observation post was located, we found ourselves in a narrow ravine, shot by the enemy. The wounded horse, furious with pain, dragged one sledge straight into the fire until it fell. The other sledge managed to wrap up in a side branch of the ravine. We got our breath. Looked around. 
listened to where the shooting was coming from. We seem to have settled down, Comrade Lieutenant. We can set tasks, Junior Lieutenant V.I. Bykov turned to me. But it was up to the commander of the 1st Rifle Battalion, ASSS Sokolov. We have not been dusty, aristocrats of engineering, met us with Bykov Senior Lieutenant Sokolov. By the way, it is dangerous to ride on sledges nowadays. You can go straight to the Kroats. How many passes can you make? Three, one squad per pass. The battalion commander, leaning out of the snow trench, showed the axes of future passages on the terrain. Everything under the snow is hidden, Sokolov said quite loudly. And when they went into the attack, they left so many men behind. Bullets from above, mines from below. The sun appeared. The snow became dazzlingly silvery. The repeated artillery preparation rang out, and three mine squads crawled forward, following together with Bykov behind the squad Sergeant V. I, Pilipsev, I followed the squad. I, Pilipsev, I saw well how in front of me two fighters with feelers, behind them one with a mine detector, then the sergeant himself, and two more miners crawled on the right and left. The probing began from the place where the first fighters who had attacked here a few hours ago had fallen. The detachment had already advanced 50 metres on the place of the supposed minefield, and, judging by the actions of the miners, they had not yet found mines. But here Pilips have slightly lifted up, swung the cat on the rope and threw it forward. Then, pulling the hook on himself, he caused an explosion. By the nature of the explosion and the scattering of metal balls that scattered across the snow, it was not difficult to determine that these were the infamous anti-personnel springminen. How much trouble these mines gave us at the front. In a metal cup was a cylinder with explosives and 300 shrapnel. Three fuses were screwed into the top cover of the mine. One was a pressure fuse with three tendrils and two were tension fuses. When triggered, the bouncer charge ejected the mine from the cup and it exploded at a height of about one and a half metres, scattering shrapnel within a radius of up to 20 metres. These mines were also intended for our brother miners. They were usually used to cover anti-tank barriers. And this time the scattered shrapnel seriously wounded one of the miners, hit a sergeant. But one of the soldiers, who was near the mine, remained unharmed. The lucky man got into the dead space, which was not affected by shrapnel. In the future, miners sometimes used this weakness of the generally very effective German mine. Following the Springman and found quite deeply sitting under the snow TMI-42 German anti-tank 8kg round mines with metal bodies. The first three miners marked their locations, and Pilipsev and one of the old men rather quickly freed them from the snow, and then simply dragged them away from the passage. There was no time to remove as it was supposed to be done. TMI's fuses with short and thick mine detonators. When infantrymen of senior Lieutenant Sokolov with shouts of ah, rah, were already running past us through the passage in the mines, enemy volleys echoed in the frosty air. That was the last thing I heard. A flicker of flame flashed in my mind's eye, flaring brightly in the thick smoke that obscured the sparkling whiteness of the snow. The red flap instantly grew to a huge ball of fire. It also went out suddenly. Darkness came, I fell into blackness. It's hard to say how much time passed. Somewhere far, far away, a whisper was heard he's finally regaining consciousness. I recognised the voice of Emin. Volodina, the company's military officer. So, alive. But along with the first joy arose a heavy anxiety. With difficulty raised leaden eyelids, saw next to the smiling face of Masha Volodina. She was opening her mouth wide, obviously. She was screaming. But only a faint whisper reached me strongly concussed. But you are very lucky. The sun had already set. The quilted blanket of clouds seemed pink from the last rays of the daylight, hidden behind the hills, and in the village the shooting was still going on in some places. The next day, before leaving the liberated village, the company said goodbye forever to two elderly miners and a sergeant. Serious, concentrated they lay before us, and even the young sergeant seemed much older. And you barely dodged yesterday, too, shouted in my ear Volodya Nazarov, who among us thought then that Volodya himself had only a few months to live. A mournful salute from machine guns and rifles rang out, 
We said goodbye to our comrades in arms and walked forward, leaving behind us three low mounds with pyramids. Dot, 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 already far beyond Markovka Company caught up with Lieutenant M.A. Zharov. With two sergeants and a squad of soldiers he arrived after the surrender of minefields in the area of Kaskovka, Rudovka. Several days of separation, because of the rapidly changing events seemed to him, apparently a long time. He hugged Nazarov and me, and then, lowering his eyes, gloomily said. Sergeant Chernish was lost. The best mineral. Such a good-looking guy. And how stupidly it turned out. I can't forgive myself. And the case was like this. Sergeant V. Chernish, a squad commander. Chernish was sent with Private A. Sereda to Rudovka. The night was dark, frosty. The wind mixed up all the snow trails and toboggan tracks. The miners lost their way and wandered for a long time. When the outline of a house appeared in the snowy haze, they accelerated their steps without hesitation. When they came closer, a machine gun burst. Sereda cried out and fell. Sergeant Chernish took the wounded man on his shoulders and crawled away. About an hour later they heard dogs barking. And again machine gun bursts struck, there were cries of halt. Trying to get his bearings, Chernish dragged Sereda in the opposite direction. In the morning, at Sereda's request, the exhausted sergeant left him in a dilapidated lonely shed and went to his own men for help. All this was told later by the recovered Sereda, and two kilometres from the barn, Lieutenant Jarov found the body of Sergeant Chernish covered with snow. Nearby lay a black German automatic rifle. Not far away the corpses of two Hitlerites were found. About what happened after Chernish left his wounded comrade in the barn, we could only guess. The rifle division with which our battalion continued the offensive was transferred from the Voronezh front to the southwestern front. We stepped on the Ukrainian land. The winter was unusually snowy. The prickly wind and frost were penetrating both behind the felt boots and under the sheepskin coat. Many soldiers and commanders, who were in the frost for several days in a row, despite the good clothes, got frostbite. The front line became discontinuous. In villages and in district centres were equipped with strongholds and defence nodes of the enemy. To repel a settlement meant to rest in warmth and to expose the enemy to frost. Fighters jokingly called it a freezing tactic. The deep snow cover stopped automobile transportation. There was neither strength nor time to clear the roads by hand. Ammunition supply was carried out on sleds. Regimental and divisional artillery was dragged through the snow by slow but strong oxen. When the road section was cleared, a division of rocket mortars appeared, supporting the division's offensive with the fire of their Katyushas. On January 19th, Nazarov and I were summoned to the commander's office to receive a new assignment. In a hotly heated hut near Novopskov, we met the commander of the Katyusha division, Guards Captain I. Podoprigora. On his pale face stood out black eyes and moustache. Without letting out of his mouth a pipe in the form of Mephistopheles' head, Podoprigora was encouraging the commander. It's good for you, sappers. There's nothing to answer for. But I have secret machines. Try to abandon or let the Germans seize them. You found someone to envy. Mysyakov began to boil. What's it to you, Dandy? The road will be cleared. He went out tube 05, on his own again, and changed his firing position to a warm stove. I guess you decide who lives cheerfully and freely in the war. Volodya Nazarov joined the conversation. A sapper, an intendant, an infantryman, an adjutant, an airborne paratrooper, but not me. Is that right? Combat immediately put an end to the argument. You're a friend, Podoprigora, but I won't give you a platoon. I'm carrying out the last order. That's right. And the commander ordered support the infantry. We unfolded the maps. The situation in the division's offensive zone became more complicated. The village of Novopskov could not be captured from the start. In regiments there was a big shortage, the soldiers were exhausted by continuous battles, and the artillery lagged behind. Hitlerites stubbornly defended a large district centre, they desperately clung to two and one-storey good houses. 
there was a danger of being drawn into long and exhausting street battles. In this situation, the division commander decided to withdraw the rifle units that had occupied the eastern part of the village and replace them with our battalion and the division's chemical company. The main forces of the division were ordered to make a covert night march manoeuvre to bypass Novopskov and strike from the rear. Your company to replace the 2nd Rifle Battalion. Maisyakov held a red pencil on my map. Put everyone in line riders, cooks and other company intelligentsia. But watch that Hitlerites didn't get wind of the shift. And if they do, stand to the death. With the onset of darkness, the company began to replace the infantrymen defending the captured outskirts of Novopskov. Platoon commanders arranged the soldiers in pairs. The enemy was throwing flares and firing sluggishly. Together, with the commander of the 2nd Rifle Battalion, we went around our defence area, running from house to house and hiding behind hastily arranged barricades. There were no signs of life in the houses. The inhabitants either left or hid in cellars. All night our miners fired and periodically discharged rockets in the direction of the invisible enemy, diverting his attention. Before dawn we heard an unusual noise and suspicious fiddling from the enemy. Somewhere in the distance a firing duel had started. Comrade Lieutenant, the Krauts are getting away. We must pursue. Panting from running, reported my deputy in formation M.A. Jarov, gathering fighters at the church, on the dome of which already played cold January dawn, we moved forward. The enemy was hastily leaving the village, leaving the wounded and artillery. The division continued the offensive day and night. We slept on the move and during short breaks, slept on sledges, haylofts and only occasionally in houses. Near Belokorokino Company caught up with Maisyakov. Which platoon is closer? he asked from the start. Urgent task. To build the NP, the time one night. Not listening to the report on the situation in the company, the commander smirked. Well, so what? It's difficult for everyone. Here with me Colonel Gerasimov at the command post reported on the phone to his superiors about the difficulties, and ended like this in the snow on oxen we win. Sheltering from the wind in the barn, Masyakov unfolded the map and poked a pencil at the point planned for the equipment of the division observation post. You, academician, know fortification better than other company men, told about Verbanai others. You take the lead. That's right. Show me what you've been taught. I'll be there at dawn. We were used to not seeing Misyakov for days at a time. He appeared in the company suddenly. He familiarised himself with the situation, clarified the tasks and rushed to other units. That day he acted as usual. Having finished talking, the commander jumped into the sled, but suddenly turned around sharply. Yes, I forgot to warn about the mines they put a few days ago, miners, 207th biz. Look, you to demine. Be careful, understand? He showed the area where the mines were planted on the map, which was torn up by the wind. So don't forget in the snow, on oxen we win. It was not easy to find the mines placed behind enemy lines by the 207th biz a few days ago. For some reason we didn't get the forms for the mines we had laid. And yet Sergeant Shepak with Red Army men Puzanov, Yerats and Tolstikov quickly found what they were looking for. The first group of mines was found at the fork of the highway. A large German artillery tractor blew up there. Having fallen on the side, it blocked the highway. And Hitlerites made a detour winter road, not giving themselves the labour to remove the remaining mines. During demining our miners found here already rare domestic TM-35. These square anti-tank mines in a metal case were produced before the war. They had an explosive charge, which was clearly too small for medium and heavy tanks, but they were known to be easy to carry and safe to install. The second group of mines was 500 metres away near a highway intersection. It was found by a wrecked military passenger car, the remains of which were visible near the road. The third group of mines was found near the railroad station. Aren't you looking for mines? asked Nazarov old man railroader when miners approached the station. If so, follow me. I'll show you where the partisans set them. What partisans? asked the deputy commander. And who knows them? They were in white coats. I was on night duty, 
but I was afraid to approach them, and so I was tortured by the fascists. How did they know about the mines, Grandpa? They guessed by the explosion. Thanks to the old railroader, the men of the company disarmed the third group of mines quite quickly. If it were not for the old man, we would have had a lot of trouble, Nazarov reported to me. And you know, almost died fighter Ryadnov. He was seriously wounded. It's not easy to look for a mine in the snow. Still, the miner made a mistake. And when we gathered in the school building to warm up and rest, Nazarov, wiping the misted machine gun, half-voiced sang. We were all wrong once. In studies, friends and love, but only for a minesweeper payback, is in the soldier's blood. Since the beginning of 1943, the commanders of the units were allowed to replenish on the spot to the staff at the expense of persons liable for military duty. This was done, of course, in coordination with village and district councils. We searched for 15 sappers who were surrounded in 1941 to 1942 and temporarily settled in the nearest villages. Most of them were eager to continue their service, so got into the company GP, Shulga, A.I. Bogdanov, N.G. Kolodyazhny, and some other fighters. They quickly mastered the new types of mines, techniques of mining, methods of disarming explosive barriers. At the same time in the company returned two elderly Red Army soldiers, S.D., Uvarov and Z. Garifilin, who were due to wounds in the army hospital. Both of them happily hugged their commanders and company comrades, told them how hard they had worked to be sent to their native battalion, having rejected the most tempting offers. For more than a week they persistently searched for the company. They travelled either by hitchhiking or by sledge, and in the last days they had to make a lot of distance on foot, following the traces of parts that were moving forward, and here caught up. During one of the political informations, Nazarov very skillfully cited this case as an example of devotion to his unit. And later, after leaving the encirclement near Kharkov, many soldiers with the same persistence in a very difficult combat situation managed to find the remnants of our company and joined it. The replenishment came. It's time to solve an important problem the company cook must be changed, Nazarov persistently told me. Or am I wrong? Kushakov and cooks badly, and just the sight of him sour the soup. And the ancients said that the way to the heart of a soldier is through his stomach. Well, we'll have to pick one of the newcomers. I've been looking, I've been talking. No one responds. First they say you have to fight with a mine, not with a kettle. That's right. Let the soldiers choose for themselves. The cook was Pavel Nikolaevich Bovin, an elderly mineral, a jolly man and a joker who had fought in the First World War. All right, if you're not afraid that I'll stuff your stomachs with explosives, I'll make a taste of your metropole. Soon Bovin invited Volodina, the paramedic, and me to sample the soup. The cheeks are not salty at all. What's the matter, comrade company officer? I put half a bucket of salt in. I guess the salt is still young. The soldiers surrounded us and laughed. Yes, with a chief like Uncle Pasha, everything will be delicious. Or dot 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 at the end of January our division was stopped at the boundary of Svatovo and went to the defence. After intense fighting the units received replenishment and pulled up rear units that had fallen behind in the deep snow. The company started mining west of Svatovo and along the Krasnaya River. We installed German metal mines TMI-42, which we got as war trophies in large quantities. For the third day I was in the newly formed 3rd Platoon, which was commanded by a capable and brave young man, the namesake of the commander of the 2nd Platoon, Staff Sergeant M.S. Danilov. During the day held classes with the replenishment, and at night we checked how the newcomers learned the installation of mines. My main task was to assist the temporarily appointed platoon commander. Suddenly, a liaison officer arrived. The battalion commander called me. Ah, the commander of the second guard's company. Maisyakov had already stopped calling me academician. Get your assignment. Have you heard about the new events? News of the events of early February 1943 great joy echoed in our hearts. The German group at Stalingrad has been completely eliminated. Almost a quarter of a million people lost the Nazis. 
Even then, it was difficult to overestimate the importance of this victory. Everyone felt a decisive turning point in the course of the war. Deputy Volodya Nazarov was reciting Olga Bergoltz's poems with youthful delight. And the hour has struck. The first blow has struck. The villain is retreating from Stalingrad. And the world gasped, recognizing what loyalty means and the rage of men who believe. The two of us rushed to give talks in the platoons. Everyone was celebrating, hugging each other, kissing. As if in response to the Stalingrad events, the troops of the 6th Soviet Army north of Svatovo went on the offensive in the direction of Balaklia. The 210th Biz was brought back again to the Voronezh front, under the command of which the brigade was. Our battalion was given the task of demining the banks of the Don. The commander ordered the second company to move independently to the area of Pavlovsk, and we left Svatovo. The way was long. From Svatovo through Ravenki to Pavlovsk on the Don 350 kilometers. The terrain crossed by ravines under deep snow seemed to be a white plain. We were getting farther and farther from the front line to the rear. Only the hum of airplanes and howling of wind occasionally broke the icy silence. The head guard of the company column was followed by a kitchen, mounted on a sledge. Its smoke waved shamefully ahead of the company. Platoons followed on foot, trying to keep up with the company cook Bovin. Weary soldiers sat down on the sled of the economic unit. It allowed to recover strength and make transitions on 35 to 45 kilometers a day. The snow-covered road was marked by cars sticking out from under the snow, broken wagons and long-ago stiffened enemy corpses. We got off off the highway and followed the shortest route. But even here, like milestones on the way, frozen bodies could be seen near the powdered tracks. Two days passed. The company caught up with a slowly moving column of prisoners. They looked miserable. The prisoners were accompanied by several boys of about 15 to 17 years old, armed with Russian three-line rifles and Italian carbines. Who are you? We are from the extermination squad. Where are you taking the prisoners? To Ravenki. They'll warm up there. While they were hiding, they got shriveled up. They were looking for us to surrender. The Italians really wanted to surrender. They didn't hide it. They dreamed of one thing to finish the agonizing transition through the Russian desert, which was frostbound. At one of the crossroads in the whiteness of the snow blizzard we met a group of civilians. Some were dressed in tattered coats or cloaks, others had on their shoulders the Russian half-coats with which they had been supplied on the way. With their backs turned to the wind, the men huddled closely together. The petty officer who accompanied this group came up to ask how best to get to the nearest village. And who are these people? we asked. God knows them. Now there are a lot of foreigners on our land. A young soldier, who was accompanying the foreigners together with the petty officer, intervened in the conversation. Well, comrade petty officer, they are French. There is even one academician among them. We approached and talked. Some of the Frenchmen spoke little Polish and Russian, and the others helped as much as they could. All of them were arrested at different times in France, and ended up in fascist concentration camps. About a month ago, Hitlerites transferred Frenchmen from the concentration camp, which was in Poland, to trench work. Somewhere to the east of Kharkov, on the defensive line of the enemy, they were liberated by the Red Army units. What did they experience? It is better not to remember, they said, but now we are happy that we got rid of fascists. The Red Army good, no wonderful, but the Russian winter is bad, very cold. But the Russian food is wonderful. After the fascist camps, it seems that we are fed in the best Parisian restaurant. Among us is a doctor of medicine of world renown. Here he is. A tall, thin man, about 60 years old, was led under the arms. One of the tribesmen said something to him, and the old man took out a thick, crumpled paper from under his coat and rags. It was carefully unfolded, protecting it from the evil wind, and we made out the name of the French National Academy. Apparently this paper was carefully hidden from the Nazis. The old scientist was obviously considered the banner of the whole group. 
We explained to the petty officer who these people were. We provided them with Italian galettes and cigarettes. We showed them the way to a nearby village and warmly said goodbye to the former prisoners of Hitler's concentration camps. Dot, 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 the only woman in our company, Masha Volodina, a military paramedic, did most of the way on foot. She walked alternately with each platoon, silently listening to ingenuous soldier stories and anecdotes. Tired soldiers, seeing Masha next to them, pulled up, walked briskly. They got used to her. In their own way they took care of her, protecting her from many military hardships. And Masha treated everyone equally and attentively. Usually Volodina and Nazarov went forward at the end of the day on light company sledges. As lodgers it was not easy to find a place to spend the night. A large part of the settlements from Ravenki to Rososha and further to Pavlovsk was completely burned. Only stove stacks sticking out of the snow, and wounded branches of apple and cherry trees from homestead gardens confirmed that the topographic maps did not lie, and there really used to be villages on these places. In some places there was smoke coming from under the ground, it was the inhabitants, faithful to their native places, who equipped dugouts near the ashes of their houses or adapted the surviving cellars for habitation. People were rarely seen. I remember meeting an old woman who was carrying burnt logs on a sled with a boy, either for fuel or to build a dwelling. We stopped. The old woman smiled at us. What's new, sons? How far did they drive Hitler away? Not very far. Where do you live, Granny? It's not a question of where. You can always build a house. If only my sons were alive. I was immediately reminded of my mother. She can't wait for news either. We must help the woman. It's even harder for her than for our mothers, as if Volodya Nazarov guessed my thoughts. They are in the rear. You know, I'm alone with my mother. What it's like for her, think about it. It's probably no easier for yours either. Four sons and all at the front. Letters take a long time. Maybe your mother knows something about your brothers? No, Volodya, she doesn't write anything new either. Mother's letters. I used to get them with every mail, and when there were breaks in the fighting I often received two or three envelopes at once. Every line written by my mother was dedicated to my three brothers. All of them were older than me and had volunteered in July 1941 in the People's Militia. Izyaslav commanded the regiment's reconnaissance platoon, Neom served in an artillery unit, and the oldest Georgie was a private in a rifle division. My mother connected me not only with my brothers. Thanks to her I even knew the fate of many of my friends. Talking with the deputy, I did not take my eyes off the elderly woman we met. Volodya Nazarov immediately allocated a cart to bring her logs. The soldiers set up a stove in the basement equipped for housing, shared their rations. Everything was done as for their mothers. We approached the city of Pavlovsk from the eastern bank of the Don, which had previously been occupied by the enemy. Having passed the ashes of several Pryden villages, the company halted at the road descent to the ice. Ahead, on the opposite steep bank, small one- and two-storey houses and thick brown brushes of denuded tree branches could be seen. This was Pavlovsk badly battered by the war, but retained the signs of a nice and cosy provincial town. But it was not the picturesque Pavlovsk that attracted the attention of our miners. Their eyes were immediately drawn to the place from where we had just come. After all, it was there that we were to work. From the side of the road the banks of the Don were fenced with barbed wire. In some places on the snow we could see the corpses of people who had been blown up. Obviously they were afraid to take them out of the place where unknown death lurked under the snow. Small signs by the roadside with a laconic inscription mines were also noticeable, confirming our assumptions. The experienced eye of a mineral noticed on the snow only available to him for deciphering. Slightly noticeable details a protruding peg, a silver hair of broken and coiled wire, a shallow funnel, a hillock. Yes, not one hundred deaths are slumbering here under the snow. A snow pie with a mine filling like this is not easy to crack. Right. Nazarov said quietly. We passed through a wide passage in the minefields, made by our army colleagues during the offensive, and descended to the ice. And the soldiers kept looking back at the snowy banks stuffed with mines. 
Everyone knew soon they would have to enter into single combat with this, so far potential, insidious and many-faced death. Two days to rest, to wash up, to put everyone in order. That's it. Three more days for combat training minds, demining techniques, security measures. And then get to work, set the task met us in Pavlov's commander. Soldiers and commanders warmed up, washed and slept for many days past in battles. In the headquarters of the company on Vorovskogo Street, nine we bent over a map and schemes of minefields. I have to go. And you try to be careful on these minefields. It is impossible to make a mistake here. My deputy in the formation part, Lieutenant Jarov said with concern, going to Voronezh for replenishment for the battalion. Much depends on us, the commanders. Fighters pay for the mistakes of commanders with blood. And blood, as old Mephistopheles said, is a juice of a very special quality. Isn't it? Volodya Nazarov said with his usual emotionality. Yes, there was a lot to think about. We had to allocate a group of the best miners for preliminary reconnaissance and removal of samples of mines, without which it was impossible to effectively conduct training. February sun burned the top layer of snow, and it began to melt like a steering candle, exposing some of the wire tension mines. Staff Sergeant Shebak turned around and shouted, The permission to go alone. You move away just in case. Andrei Markovich somehow inwardly gathered himself, took a breath of air and, exposing a mine detector in front of him, stepped onto the minefield. Carefully and slowly, as if under him the edge of the abyss, put his foot on the snow. After listening to the frame of the mine detector, he carefully probed the snow cover with a special stylus. Large drops of sweat glistened on Shebak's face in the sunlight. He nodded to us and squatted down. It seemed that a long time had passed, and Sheshabak continued to remove thin layers of snow, as archaeologists do when digging up precious antiquities. Finally, the senior sergeant stood up, showing us with a slightly trembling hand a long, 35-centimetre cylinder. At the bottom, the metal body of the mine was flattened with a wedge for embedding in the ground or snow, and at the top, it was wrapped with a wire spiral. The walnut-coloured metal cylinder turned out to be a tension-acting anti-personnel fragmentation mine. I got a new one, Shebak shouted. It looks like our poms. A round talker bomb is inserted on top. Shebak's trial search, which lasted more than two hours and cost not only him but also us a lot of tension, was successful. Andrei Markovich removed several samples of mines unknown to us. We were preparing extended and concentrated charges, incendiary tubes for their detonation, mine cats, for continuous demining. The mines were not to be discharged but exploded. It was impossible to risk people. And yet the next day, when on the order of the commander additional samples of mines were taken off, one of the experienced mine scouts, Senior Sergeant Nikolai Goncharenko, exploded. The company paramedic Masha Volodina and the young mistress of the house Raya Ponomava gave the wounded first aid and quickly sent the senior sergeant to the field hospital. He lost a lot of blood. A month and a half later, we received a letter from him. Hello, my dear commander. I'm on the mend. Please give my regards to all the company men. Write to me, please. While in the hospital, I want to know your life, as if I stayed with you in the ranks. And goodbye for now wrote a modest and thoughtful Pomkov's vodka platoon. Not long, however, we had to stay in the Don town of Pavlovsk. The order on urgent transfer of the battalion to Kharkov stopped the work that had just begun. The complete demining of the banks of the Don was postponed for the time being.